All right. So here we go. Thank you for joining us this evening. Tonight, we will explore the historical legacies and contemporary experiences of Native American peoples with an emphasis on peace building and nonviolent approaches. We will learn about the Piscataway Kanoi tribe, and we are deeply grateful for our guest speaker and his willingness to share his culture, time, and energy with us this evening. Throughout the evening, we will reflect on the theme of relationship and analyze some of the wider American mythologies that influence our understanding and connections with Native American peoples. We'll also survey ongoing efforts to advance the rights of Indigenous peoples and address issues of violence affecting Indigenous women. Before we dive in, let's take a moment to consider your initial thoughts on this subject. So in the chat, please share a word or image that comes to mind when you hear the phrase Native American heritage. We may find that some of these, these images and phrases are, are rather cliche <laughs> um, or embedded in our pop culture in a way that um, don't seem to have a whole lot of nuance. And that's something that we're, we're hoping to explore tonight. So um, lean into that discomfort. Here's an overview of our evening together. Tonight, we will survey Native American contributions to peace building work, We'll then engage in a series of discussions, activities, and dialogue reflections. And lastly, we invite you to record your own questions and themes for discussion as we will conclude with an interactive Q&A discussion. Before we start our discussion, I want to share a brief in introduction to our special list of guest speakers. This evening, we welcome two featured guest presenters with us who have been kind enough to share their knowledge and experience with us together this evening. Tonight, our presenters include me, Chris Wolonski. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm the Director of Programs and Partnerships for Peace Through Action USA. You'll be able to learn about us in just a sec. We welcome Kyle Swan, who belongs to the, Believer, the Beaver Clan of the Piscataway Kanoi Tribe. Um, we're super grateful for his presence with us tonight, um, and we acknowledge that that's a vulnerable position. So um, thank you so much, Kyle, for joining us. We also welcome Scott Strickland, who serves as the Deputy Director of the Maryland Archaeological Conservation Lab through the Jefferson Patterson Museum. We'll learn more about our guest speakers after we briefly discuss the nature of our work at Peace Through Action USA. So next is the organizational host this evening. I'll introduce us, Peace Through Action USA. We're a national scope organization. We have an exciting year ahead, so please spread the word to your friends and family about our virtual events, which we do um, pretty much every month at this point. And our primary project of this nature is occurring in Calvert County, Maryland at the Calvert Peace Project, which is our flagship peace project site. Um, and just reading our mission statement here, we activate and equip Americans to implement practical peaceful solutions to aggression and violence in their communities and our country. So with that, we'd also like to thank our partners and supporters of this project, Broadview Church. They are uh, they operate as our primary funders and main supporters in our work, and we're exceptionally grateful for their vision, dedication, and commitment to peace. Um, I'd also like to, again, just uplift the Calvert Peace Project. If you're not familiar, many of many of our registrants tonight are Calvert re residents, so um, you know that's like the nucleus and heart of our work at Peace Direction USA. So um, please do explore um, our activities there. So next in the chat, if you could, um, what inspired you to attend this event with us tonight? What what are your motivations? What are your goals? Um, we're eager to hear that. Native American Heritage Month observed in the United States during November is a time dedicated to recognizing, celebrating and honoring the diverse cultures, contributions, and histories of Native American peoples. The month provides an opportunity for education, reflection, and the promotion of awareness regarding the rich heritage and experiences of Native Americans throughout the country. So I just wanna share a few quick facts. Um, basically, you know, Native American, Native Americans as a, as a demographic is actually, um, cons constitutes a, a wide range of diverse tribes. Uh, this is not a homogenous group, but consists of over 500 distinct tribes, um, which likely have their own nuances and distinctions within those, um, each with its own unique languages, traditions, and cultural practices contributing to the rich tapestry of indigenous heritage in the US. 
Um, similarly, these are sovereign nations. Native American tribes hold the status of sovereign nations, allowing them the right to self-governance, or at least we would hope for that. Um, we'll probably learn tonight that that, that vision is actually um, farther from reality. Um, this recognition reflects the distinct, distinct political and cultural identity of each tribe. Um, also, the, the cultural contributions, developments, and spiritual orientations of Native American peoples um, are just a, a deep reservoir of wisdom um, that, that I think inform our, our modern life in ways that are, are deeply valuable and important. Um, so yeah, Native American cultures have made lasting contribu contributions to global agriculture, introducing staple foods like corn, potatoes, beans. Um, additionally, they have artistic traditions, including beadwork, basketry, pottery, that all carry deep cultural and spiritual significance. Um, and, and also kind of just wanna close on this note of resiliency, um, resiliency amidst genocide and collective trauma. Native American communities remain resilient against systemic attempts to destroy and exterminate their cultures. Native peoples have endured great hardships, including um, you know, some, for some of us reflecting on, on the history, history class we may or may not have had, um, you know, the Trail of Tears, boarding schools, forced relocation, genocide, biological warfare, violence, cultural appropriation, among others. Um, and while Native American tribes are often migratory with seasons and the movement of animals and plant seasonality, this is a great general layout of the peoples who inhabited the U.S., um, it's important to note that many of these cultures had a different relationship to the notion of territory than is popularly espoused today. Uh, land was not regarded as property in the way that um, we, we treat it today as an object to be obtained or bought or sold. Um, instead, it was an integral part of one's relationship um, to the earth. So um, before we get into speaking with our, our guest presenters tonight, I, I wanted to just highlight the valuable um, like treasures that we have been given by Native American cultures, um, in particular our work with peace building. Um, I, I owe a great deal of gratitude to Native American cultures for the nature of, of the work that we do here. Um, and so I'll kind of explore some of these um, peaceful practices that Native American cultures developed in their social technologies that we now, I think, are, are only now seeing the value of implementing in um, to address modern ills. So one of these being a circle process. Many Native American tribes use a circle process for decision making and conflict resolution. This involves sitting in a circle where everyone has an equal voice and discussing issues until a consensus is reached. This fosters open communication and emphasizes community involvement and problem solving. Um, similarly, there's a talking stick, which is a tool used in many Native American cultures during meetings or conflict resolution. Only the person holding the stick is allowed to speak, ensuring that each individual has a chance to express their thoughts without interruption. This promotes respectful communication and active listening. Um, Further, one topic we've discussed in the past, um, but something that we're exploring um, for future engagements is restorative justice. Justice, as as we've kind of discussed, um, restorative justice is a key principle in many Native American cultures. This approach focuses on repairing the harm caused by an offense rather than punishing the offender. It often involves bringing together the parties involved along with community members to discuss the impact of the actions and work toward a resolution that benefits everyone. And here you can see kind of this um, offender community and victim all, all kind of merge at this interplay of res restorative justice, a restorative approach. Mediation by elders. Um, elders play a crucial role in many Native American communities as mediators and advisors. There's a there's a certain uh, wisdom that's respected and that experience is valued and they often mediate conflicts, offering guidance to find resolutions that are in line with cultural values. Similarly, there's an emphasis on community involvement. 
Um, Native American approaches to conflict resolution often involve the entire community. Decisions and resolutions are not solely the responsibility of individuals directly involved in the conflict, but are collective efforts. This fosters a sense of shared responsibility and accountability. Some Native American tribes incorporate ceremonies and rituals into conflict resolution processes. These may include practices that symbolize purification, forgiveness, or the restoration of balance within the community. Um, respect for nature and harmony is also um, interwoven with this emphasis um, on the interconnectedness of all living things and the importance of maintaining harmony with nature. This perspective can influence conflict resolution by encouraging individuals to consider the broader impact of their actions in the community and the environment. And then lastly, just kind of wanted to um, share this practice of counting coup, which was a traditional practice among many Native American tribes where warriors would achieve distinction in battle, not by inflicting harm, but by touching their enemies with a coup stick or bare hand and then escaping unharmed. This act symbolized bravery and skill, emphasizing the ability to confront an opponent directly and engage and emerge victorious without causing harm. Um, so that being said, I just, I, I wanted to give a brief survey of, of ways that um, Native American cultures have, have uh, influenced practices that we can incorporate in our, our regular lives. Um, and just to, to value those contributions. Um, so that being said, we now would like to welcome our first guest speaker this evening, Kyle Swan. Um, Kyle belongs to the Beaver Clan of the Piscataway Kanoi tribe. Um, I've included parts of Kyle's bio here, but for those who are curious, please visit our website. We'll also share resources of the Piscataway Kanoi tribe for you to explore as well. Um, so Kyle, you're with us tonight. Can you please introduce yourself and explain what inspires you to speak with our audience this evening? Hi everyone, Kyle Swan here, Beaver, Beaver Clan of the Piscataway Kanoi tribe, son of Chief Swan and direct descendant of Juanus. Um, tonight, you know, I definitely have the honors to be able to share some knowledge that I've been able to gather, um, you know, in this lifetime so far on my ancestors and my tribal community. Um, and when I got in, initially reached out to, um, it was Chris's first words that actually brought my attention, um, you know, just on the, the great awareness that, you know, this organization seems to have um, when it comes to native issues, especially in contemporary times. So with that being said, I just would like to say thank you to everyone um, for being here, for everybody that was able to put this uh, event together. And, um, you know, I hope that we are able to all come out of this on a better side together. Thank you, Kyle. Um, do you want me to go ahead and go through? Yeah, if you're if you're comfortable, I've I've included a slide here with some images um, from the Piscataway oh, Kanoi tribe and um, invite you to share so, however you um, like. I have a presentation that I can actually share um, shortly, but you know today, uh, what my intent is to is to just share a brief overview of some significant history um, and contemporary experiences of the tribal community, not just of myself, but of many members within the uh, the tribe for today. Um, and so, with that being said, let me try to share my screen with you all. Awesome. Here, I'll stop sharing so you can have access. All right. Am I good to go? Can everybody see my screen? I cannot. You cannot. Okay. All right, how are we doing now? Great. Thumbs up right. on my end. Anybody else thumbs up? Yes, <laughs> I'm seeing thumbs up, so you're good. All uh, right, wonderful, thank you all. 
So today, um, just a brief overview of what we're going to be talking about. Um, like I said, we're going to be talking about some significant history, contemporary experiences, and the nonprofit that, um, you know, we're able to raise a lot of support for what we do as a community. Uh, first, starting with our significant history, um, the way that I've organized today is this section is primarily before the 19th century. Um, so whether analyzing, you know, our pre-colonial history before the 1600s or all the way up to the 20th century, um, perhaps, the various interactions um, that the tribal community has had with the English colonizers and the resulting government of Maryland, DC, and Virginia, um, you know, there's been multiple decisions made by the tribal leadership and families to preserve our culture within the community. A lot of our contemporary experiences today is the precursor to the history that was before. Um, our identities, our politics today, and our community interactions, uh, not just with the state um, and other governmental entities and officials, but just in terms of society altogether, um, is the narrative and the context of those before. And a lot that we see going on today, um, as you can see, I've put, it's equated to history repeating itself. And we hear this time and time again, um, but I'll get into that shortly later. And then the nonprofit uh, that has brought me here today and is able to sponsor a good bit of the work that's being done in the tribal community was founded by Chief Swan. Um, I believe back in 2021 was when we were able to uh, file for nonprofit status with the IRS. But the intent of Through Piscataway Eyes is to promote and protect the welfare, culture, and history for the citizens of the Piscataway Kanoi tribe. So, with that being said, um, you know, a large portion of our audience today, including myself, um, and I believe you also, Chris, um, we're all on Piscataway land. And with today being the center topic of Piscataway culture, the best way to go forward, um, you know, like any instance, is with an acknowledgement. So with that being said, um, we acknowledge the grounds of the ancestral homelands to the Piscataway people. And our ancestors have lived here and made footsteps through these lands for thousands of years before the colonists had landed. We acknowledge that our lands of our ancestors cover all of the western bank of the Chesapeake, including what is now Charles, Calvert, and St. Mary's counties, Howard County, Anne Arundel County, Prince George's County, Montgomery County, Baltimore City and Baltimore County, Frederick County, Washington County, and Carroll County, as well as Washington, D.C., and into Virginia, the Northern Neck, and parts of the Panhandle of West Virginia. We acknowledge the lands of the Piscataway people are the unceded lands of these present-day counties, and that there were multiple treaties entered into with our people, and all were broken until so Washington, D.C. had restored our fishing rights. We acknowledge that our people were not citizens of this land that was stolen from our ancestors until the 1920s and did not own land of our own. We acknowledge that many people did not receive acknowledgement until the 1950s and 60s with the civil rights movement. And we recognize that although millions of people came and continued to come to this country for religious freedom, it wasn't until 1978 when the American Indian Freedom Religious Act was passed did our people and Native Americans across the country we're legally allowed to exercise traditional religions by ensuring access to sites, our use and possession of sacred objects, and freedom to worship through ceremonial and traditional rites. We acknowledge that our people were here for thousands of years before the colonists and were not recognized as a tribe along with the Piscataway Indian Nation until 2012's Maryland State recognition. And after fighting for 40 to 50 years to be recognized, we acknowledge that neither the Piscataway Kanoi tribe nor Piscataway Indian Nation have federal recognition, especially being one of the tribes of first contact and that the United States resides on our ancestral lands. We acknowledge that the Piscataway citizens of both tribes still pay property taxes on the stolen lands of our ancestors. And we fully acknowledge that no other race of people has proved who they are. Wanishi. So starting off today, um, I went ahead and I recovered the ancestral lands of the Piscataway, um, listing all of the unceded counties of what uh, they're referred to as today. Um, you know, starting before colonization, there's not much history that we are able to have documented in the same context 
as Afro. Um, but what we are able to have, um, you know, it, it fills in a, a lot of holes that have occurred throughout the years. Um, so at the time of our colonial contact, our estimates in our population have ranged now between two to 7,000 Piscataway citizens. Um, this great, greatly differs from our first initial estimates that um, were put down in history. Uh, at one point, I wanna say that there was a few hundred um, Piscataway in individuals that were noted. And then later on, um, I think that increased to a few thousand. But the two to 7,000 that I have noted down, that is a pretty accurate range that you know most people can, can refer to. And currently today, uh, in terms of enrolled citizens, we have 4,000 tribal citizens and tenfold that number are people who are eligible to be enrolled but have not gone through the entire enrollment process as of yet. Uh, our tribal politics and chiefdom uh, very much operated the same as many Eastern tribes. We operated in a paramount chiefdom with leadership being inherited and actively selected through lineage, lineages dating back to at least uh, 1,270 CE. So that is about the time that the woodland culture that we know throughout the Eastern shoreboard was starting to uh, evolve as what we know. And the Western Bank settlements uh, that were led by the Piscataway Taya paid regular tribute to part to be part of the umbrella leadership and protection. So, you know, there was multiple tribes within the Piscataway that although they had their separate names, they ultimately at the end of the day were Piscataway through protection and the leadership of the Tayac. And our society interactions of the environment uh, at the time of colonialization and after which um, had a lot to do with our regional governance of the Western Bank. And we had invading forces uh, from other tribes from the Western and Northern um, directions those were the Powhatan and Susquehannock, and those were straining our friendly interactions with our uh, friendly neighbors, Grenades of Coke. Uh, some history that I want to point out um, that really show the downfall that kind of happened after the onslaught of colonialization, um, especially in light of how quick the Piscataway we were able to see that the agreements that we were making were not working in our, in our benefit at all. So in 1634 um, was our first colonial contact between Lord Calvert and our Piscataway Tayak Wamis, my ancestor. Uh, he received the, the company of Lord Calvert and his men with bowmen uh, ready to draw fire. The Piscataway neither welcomed nor forbade the English from settling but we remained very reluctant to have open interactions with them. About uh, 30 years later, 28 years later to be exact, um, the Articles of 1666, uh, Peace and Amity were thought to have restored some of the peaceful interactions that first started between the Piscataway and the English colonizers that resulted in the Maryland government. Um, this article, this treaty, was basically to enshrine our rights for tribal food sovereignty, to protect our community and lands, seek refuge, um, and in return, basically concede to the colony of Maryland and its overarching rule over our people. And then, as you can see, in about half that time, in 1680, uh, we were calling for support of resistance against the, the colonies. After years of influence, interactions, diplomacy, and governance, um, it simply was not working in any good fashion and soon resulted in the Piscataway seeking support and an alliance from other tribes against the invading forces of the English. The quote that I want to share today is actually what Juanis had said in response to Lord Calvert um, when he, they had asked where they might seek land for settlements of their own. And his response was that he would not bid him go neither would he bid him stay, but that he might use his own discretion. And if we refer back to when I had started talking about the overall society interactions with other tribes, um, this type of interaction that was had with the English is kind of representative of which. Um, 
Juanes did not necessarily want to forbay a possible ally that could be resourceful in the forces that were already threatening the community. But he did not want to welcome strangers onto our ancestral lands for the sake of protection out of its, its basic necessity, but also due to the climate that we were having with other tribes. So moving forward to the late 17th and early 18th centuries, um, further encroachment, displacement had affected the Piscataway and overall tensions following the Bacon's Rebellion, um, which I'm sure so much, so many people have heard and there's still a lot of questions to be had. Um, but the Piscataway after that time had moved into the Zakaya Swamp in Southern Maryland. And the English saw this as an advantage to more freely traverse around the area and strategically use the, the Biscataway as a buffer from the northern threats of the Susquehanna and other tribes such as the Iroquois. And using it as an opportunity to keep a closer eye on us, or as they said, a closer eye to be kept um, on our activities outside of our villages. Later within the early portion of the 18th century, some Piscataway families had begun dispersing to other settlements within the Eastern region, moving farther away from English or the English or in closer proximity to just a friendlier environment of interaction. However, the core families of the Piscataway, the Swans, the Thompsons, and the Proctors that we might know today remain prevalent in the area along with some of the other tribal families. In the middle to 18th, uh, middle 18th and early 19th centuries, um, some people call this a time of silence coming from our community, but in all, all actuality, this was a time that we were facing a threat that we had never seen before. We saw a total dissolution of our tribal sovereignty by conceding to the authoritative rule of Maryland and its governor. And this became a very harsh reality. By the completion of the 18th century, all rights of the Piscataway were basically infringed upon that were enshrined to us in the 1666 Articles of Peace and Amity. And during this time, after we basically had no right of prosperity that we were guaranteed, the Piscataway began to assimilate into colonial society for the sake of preserving our community from further erasure. Despite having portrayed ourselves as part of society though, the Piscataway were continuously discriminated against and awfully fairly subjugated to crimes, furthering many families to isolate together as our homelands are further developed without regard to our community. And if you see in this photo, I have, um, I have the, the construction of the Washington Monument, which in the early 19th century, the Swan family and a few other of the Piscataway families were actually part of the construction um, in the first initial and the second, as we know that there was two sets of construction because the first patron was not able to finish the job. So in the 19th century, the Piscataway faced a lot of major shifts in our aspects of life, society, education, professions, culture, and community. With every enshrined right that we had, it was infringed upon by the English settlements moving closer, and we were dispersed from most of our pre- and post-colonial settlements. And the community, basically our day-to-day -day life was completely centered around English society as the oppressor. Our education and professions um, by 1886, the Piscataway joined together to build our own school for the community after growing concerns of how our youth weren't being properly educated for the world we were being faced. In the meantime, though, like I had said, many Piscataway had become highly reputable for our trade skills, knowledges, and businesses. And many notable constructions within the area, like the Washington Monument and the White House, the Swan and Thompson families had played a major part and their building completion, maintenance, management, and employments. For culture and community, the Piscataway had basically accepted assimilations into daily life, but remained a cultural identity behind closed doors, or in better words, on our own property. The discrimination that we received had many efforts of exclusion from society. So we isolated ourselves that led to a lot of families retaining dependence on one another. And this had a lot of 
role on the preservation of Piscataway culture, traditions, and community within the 19th century. And the photo that I have on this slide is actually a reference to the, I believe, mid 19th century, so early 20th century, of where the Swan family names are located in Southern Maryland, but more specifically, where some of our tribal schools were located. At the bottom of the map, you can see that a large portion of the Piscataway families are located near Bell Alton. And near that is also the Swan School. The Swan School was shut down in the early 20th century after growing concerns of us educating our community had risen to the Board of Education. To the left, which is over by the Potomac, now the area I believe of, um, I think that's by Piscataway Park, I'm not sure. But facing towards Virginia, that's where the Swan family had remained. And then farther north, above Waldorf, where Cedarville is, is where the Butlers, Harleys, and Proctors were. Some significant and very influential people to take note of um, starts with Oswald Swan. So the story, of the, the story and the assassination of Abraham Lincoln is taught throughout this country and often has a very crucial portion left out of it. John Wilkes Booth, when he had fled, he came to Southern Maryland and eventually became lost in Zakiah Swamp. Some may have heard that he was assisted by a free African-American man and was escorted to Dr. Mudd's house to seek medical treatment. The man that discovered John Booth though, that when he was lost in the swamp, was a Piscataway man named Oswald Swan, who later was sought after due to his help of a stranger. Another portion of the story that is left out is the fact that Oswald Swan actually had returned to another Swan house to be able to retrieve a horse and be able to properly escort John Wilkes Booth to Dr. Mudd's house. Another person that I want to bring up is Arthur Swan. Now, I, I mentioned the Swan School. This is the man that was responsible in the creation and donation of the land. The education in the tribal community had a lot of growing concerns um, among our, our citizens. And many families had siblings where we were basically sent to different schools based on the tone of our skin. But in 1920, Arthur Swan donated land of his own to construct the Swan School in Southern Maryland, allowing Piscataway youth in grades one through six to study together and not be subjugated to many of the prejudice practices that can be found within the education systems at this time. The Swan School was actually located near Allen's Fresh down in Charles County and was taught by a Baltimore teacher that the community was able to hire themselves. However, like I said, due to the education board, the school had later closed and forced many students to once again be sent to separate, separate schools as a result of segregation. Another person is Frank Swan. As policies and mindsets were shifting in a time that racial determinations were greatly changing, a narrative of native people rejecting cultural identities had generally been created among many native communities. But today we're talking about the Piscataway. Although assimilation had come into many people's life and people were leaving tradition and marrying away from the surroundings of their community, the identities of Piscataway remain strong in many aspects. And today I want to bring up the lasting memories of Frank Swan. It's a glimpse of properly claiming our cultural identity that can be seen on his funeral card. On December 11th, 1909 was when he was passed, when he passed away at 84 years of age. It's noted that he was never a slave, nor was he in strict a sense colored man. He was largely of, largely of Indian blood, which showed plainly in all features of his face. And I think that's really important to bring up, given the fact that he was claiming this at the very beginning of the 20th century, but had lived almost throughout the entire 19th century. So he saw a large change within the tribal community. Mary Edith Swan and her sisters, they were medicine women. And despite the influence of Western medicine, such as pharmaceuticals, Many turned to these women for their knowledge in medicine and how to treat ailments. Mary Edith Swan and her sisters were reputable medicine women of the Piscataway Canoe, offering their services and businesses to many people both within the tribe and outside. 
Their knowledge in being medicine women, also widely known as herbalists, was passed down from generations before and is a great contribution to today's descendants. Another person that I would like to bring up is Henry, Henry Swan. Now, with blood quantum being such a large debate, when we look at how Native history had evolved um, with the American government, the degree of one's Indianness, per se, became a great concern. And many reverberations of eugenics just became the first response to families and individuals from our tribe who were willing to share our cultural identities and knowledge and proudly claim it. Despite generations of documentation, interactions, knowledge shared, it wasn't until the 1960s what the, was the Piscataway confirmed in literature to be native, a native community of the, the Chesapeake's Western Bank. Henry Swan and his descendants were proven to comprise of a continuous center line in the lineage of the Piscataway Kanoi families and direct descendants of Piscataway Chief Juanas. Moving to some of the contemporary experiences that we've had in the past generation. Um, first, I wanna start with the Maryland State recognition. We had received this in 2012 from Governor Martin O'Malley, but this was a work in progress for nearly half of a century. This momentous point of history was held in Annapolis, I believe at the State House, and was attended with many Piscataway leaders, elders, families, citizens, and youth, along with many of the elected officials in Maryland. Another thing that is notable to bring up is Piscataway Highway. Recently, a lot of us may have heard of this, but the Maryland government has designated Route 210, stretching from Prince George's County to Charles County, for nearly 30 miles as Piscataway Highway. The tribal community had petitioned for nearly half a generation, collecting thousands of signatures, both within and outside of our community, to change the name of Indian Head Highway to Piscataway Highway. The intent of the community and Maryland House Bill 1433 was to officially change the name, but due to the layers of the governmental agencies and a lot of the bureaucratic nonsense that is greatly above our pay scales, a designation was simply granted. After which, the tribal community is still collecting and calling on elected officials to honor the intent of the law and will continue working to strike the name completely as it's the dark moment of Piscataway history that's being represented to thousands of people every day. Another notable thing to bring up is restoring our sovereignty. Having to de deconstruct colonialism takes many forms as colonialism came to us and attacked us from all around. Centering around the teachings of tradition, cultural practices and tribal knowledge is the most important. And doing so, the tribal community has in the meantime, been able to collect our own demographic and statistical information to get the help that we need for ourselves. We have started providing food to our own tribal members with a community garden so that we're able to have fresh, organic, and safe food to eat. We began relaying resources to one another. A lot of that had to do with the COVID uh, pandemic. We started gathering a lot of resources for networking ventureships, as this is a great time for entrepreneurship within the Piscataway Kanoi tribe. And we're doing a lot more to be able to support each other and work to be a sustainable community. Now moving to Through Piscataway Eyes, as I keep bringing it up. Through Piscataway Eyes was created by my father, Chief Swan. At the time of our Maryland state recognition in 2012, Chief Swan started collecting tribal statistics, demographics, healthcare and housing needs, and started compiling information to rely to where, to relay to where we needed. And with this, there was a desire to share the history and culture of the tribe. Being in opposition to those wishing to further the community by altering our history though, Chief Swan ran for tribal council to protect the tribal community, especially the Piscataway Tri-Core families. This was the basis of where this desire came from. In 2012, Chief Swan applied for the nonprofit status for Through Piscataway Eyes. Some of our accomplishments in a yearly look in 2012, we raised slightly over $40,000 and provided services and cultural events for our tribal members. But in 2022, 
we raised several hundreds of thousands of dollars and started providing more services to tribal members besides community classes. What we're doing now is we're offering scholarships for tuition and people willing to go to trade school. We're offering assistance with medical care and other prescription costs. We are making sure that there are mentorships, um, especially the opportunities of large companies that have come to our land for our youth to be able to take advantage of everything that has basically displaced us. And now we can bring that back into our community and have that knowledge to ourselves. And one thing that I want to bring up um, is what I like to call equity built from the core. And I think that's mainly on why a lot of us are here today and wanting to understand how someone can help a Native community. And I came up with this myself, but the way that I see it is it first starts with tribal investment. We are a sovereign nation, and at the end of the day, we want to do the work for ourselves because it is for ourselves and by ourselves. So the work that we're able to do we want to rely on ourselves and build up what we have around us and build up the lineages that have fallen through the cracks due to the effects of colonialism. And a lot of the ways that we're able to venture into new areas of life, but especially business um, in particular is through community support. And this can be in various ways, both on an individual and collective context. But it's the community that brings us into society and brings us into spaces that at one time we were excluded from. And surrounding all of that is partnerships, allyships, and relationships. And I covered this last because whenever we're talking about equity, what we're not talking about is equality. We're talking about something that is proportionate to one another, but still equitable in terms of something that's equatable. The way that partnerships, allyships, and relationships often partake with Native communities that I've seen recently is masked through a relationship that's really extractive of our knowledge, our time, and many other things that we're able to do and represent our culture. And with this diagram, I hope that I'm able to kind of shed some light of where support would first be given and kind of the steps and ways that we work together, especially with, a, with other communities. And with that, I would like to end with saying Wanishi in my language that means thank you. And like I had said, um, you know, today is a great pleasure to be able to be here today, and I look forward to hearing what Scott has to say. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you very much. That was very informative and loved hearing everything you had to share. So thank you. Thank you big time. We're also seeing a lot of clapping emojis in the chat. Um, so I know I'm not alone in that feeling. Um, so great, I also have some, some images here of the Piscataway Kanoe tribe. Um, and I also kind of wanted to include a discussion of missing and murdered indigenous women, um, MMIW. Uh, it's a movement that advocates for the end of violence against Native women. It also seeks to draw attention to the high rates of disappearances and murders of Native people, particularly women and girls. The MMIW movement exists because a large number of Native women go missing and are murdered each year compared to women from other groups. Um, just a kind of fast fact that really struck me in my research was the National Crime Information Center reports that in 2016 there were 5,712 reports of missing American in Indian and Alaska Native women and girls, though the U.S. Department of Justice's Federal Missing Person Database, NAM U.S., only logged 116 of those cases. Um, so this is quite literally a bleeding issue. Um, about four out of five Native women have experienced violence. Native women were about twice as likely than white women to experience violence, and Native women face murder rates 10 times the national average. 
the murder rate for native women is about three times more than that of native or than of white women. Um, so yeah, I just kind of wanted to uplift that and, and discuss that. Um, and also have this image of the red hand, um, which I, I got from the Piscataway Kanoi tribe website. Um, I don't know if Kyle, you can speak to this, but I, I, I've prepared a little bit, uh, but, um, just invite you if you have any perspective on it. Yeah, so a lot of these photos, I believe I recognize from last MMIW day. Um, and, you know, in doing so with the red hand, the red hand first initializes the conversation of somebody was here at a primitive historical type context. But the ways that Native communities had left a mark historically, um, even into the times of colonialism, was the mark of our hands. So this was in turn basically a signature, but with the placement on the mouth, um, it's representative of the abuse that women especially are subjugated to and is basically the whole message behind MMIW and the support that it's, uh, it's raising. So um, yeah, thank you for including this today, Chris. Okay, awesome. Yeah, great, thank you. And yeah, um, Kyle covered a little bit about through Piscataway Eyes, but I also wanted to include this too um, for donations um, about that scholarship fund that Kyle talked about. Um, if you'd like to contribute to that, take a screenshot now. I'll also have it at the end of the presentation so you can screenshot then. Um, but this is a way to, to continue that support. Um, and similarly, here are um, some Piscataway owned businesses that you can engage with. If that's something that you'd like to, to take part in, that's also here. So feel free to screenshot that too. Um, and then we're just gonna move into a quick discussion here. So um, I see, you know, in the interest of our time, we're, we're, we're getting close to our anticipated end time. Um, so I, I do want to respect that uh, of our guests, but I also feel that we we have a great opportunity. We've all come together right now. And um, I think, you know, it's it's good for us to have a little bit of dialogue. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to put us into breakout rooms and I would like you to discuss two questions. Um, one, how would you describe your relationship to Native American peoples? Um, you may be a Native American person, um, so in which case, um, if that uh, if that applies to you, um, please feel free to interpret that question um, uh, inversely. <laughs> um, and then, what social and cultural forces affect these relationships? So, um, yeah, we're really reflecting on relationship now. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing, and I'm gonna prompt us to move into a um, breakout room. So you'll be prompted to go into a breakout group. This will be a very short experience. So feel free to talk as much as you can. Um, and we'll, we'll circle back with each other and reflect. So um, you have all been assigned a breakout room and please feel free to join now. For those of us who are still in the chat, feel free to join your breakout room.
Okay, great. So I'm going to stop sharing so we can see one another. Um, would anyone like to share some of the insights that they, oh, I think we're still waiting for a few more people are filtering in. Um, would anyone like to share some of the insights they gathered from connecting with our your groups? Anything that seemed to be a consistent theme or stuck out to you? I know in our group, we talked about um, the heartbreak and wanting to repair mm -hmm. and be part of anything that may help. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, thank you for typing that as well, Laurel. Yeah, feel free to include that in the chat if you would like. Anyone else like to share some of the reflections from their groups? Nancy, I see you have your hand up. Feel yes. free to go for it. Um, well, I was just asking questions. We didn't have very much time in the groups, obviously, but um, I was just asking questions uh, about the erasure by data, you know, just erasing a, a whole group of people by saying they're either white or they're colored or you know whatever the census was at the time or whatever is being done and um what you know i'm just discovering this as a white person what happened um with respect to data and what could be done about it and there was discussion about the state of maryland could pass laws to for people to change the race they were designated as at the time of birth or, you know, census takers just by looking at person or something like that. So I don't know if that's something we could do, but in terms of actual helping, you know, we have to actually figure out something to do. Yeah, We have okay. online yeah. petitions for that. That's good. Yeah, great. Thank you for sharing that, Rosanna. Okay, well, if anyone else would like to add, please do so in the chat. Um, yeah, I I want to just move on to just reflect on that relationship. Um, you know, there's in some ways a kind of reason this is happening in November, right? Because we, we as Americans kind of are, um, we live within this monomyth of, um, that we re resurrect every November about uh, colonial contact and what that looked like. And so I just kind of wanted to reflect on that relationship that we have in some ways, um, the myths that we tell ourselves about ourselves as Americans um, quite frequently. So that's just something I kind of wanted to have rub elbows with um, what, what we've been discussing um, earlier in this conversation. Um, so again, I know that we are pretty much at our time here, um, but I would like to invite Scott Strickland um, to speak with us. He's the deputy director of the Maryland Archaeological Conservation Lab um, at Jefferson Patterson Park and Museum. Um, and Scott, can you please introduce yourself and explain what inspires you to speak with our audience tonight? Uh, so, I, as you mentioned, I'm the deputy director of the Maryland Archaeological Conservation Lab. Um, and a lot of my research, uh, since I've been an archaeologist, has been on kind of studying um, Anglo-Native relations, like in the 17th century in Maryland and Virginia, um, and, and working with people to record things like oral histories and try to uh, bring things from uh, where you have gaps in uh, documentary records to the present um, because of of these types of erasures that people have been talking about. Um, and 
Uh, as far as like what my presentation will be today, it's going to be focused on some of the things that uh, Kyle talked about in the significant history. Um, but I just kind of want to shed some light on uh, some additional context on some of the documents that he mentioned. But I acknowledge that it's a very tough act to follow because he did a very great job at, at summarizing like a lot of those key points. Yeah, that was an excellent presentation. <laughs> so I've made you co-host. You can you can share your screen um, whenever you're ready. Um, you had made me co-host, but I couldn't hear anything, so I had to leave and join again. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, you're good to go. All right. All right, can you see this? Yes. All right. I'll try to keep it as short as possible because 8.30 is my bedtime, so I'll, I'll go as quickly as I can. Uh, some of you uh, have probably seen John Smith's 1608 map of the Chesapeake, and for researchers like archaeologists like myself, this document is valued for depicting place names and divisions of society, but I'll note that they are as John Smith saw them. Uh, John Smith was accompanied by a native Wakamako man named Mosco, who had knowledge about the landscape that the English did not, but it cannot be said how much of Smith's map was knowledge relayed directly from Mosco. The map depicts towns as either uh, king's houses or ordinary houses, possibly determined by the size of the settlement. Uh, of the larger settlements in what is now Maryland and D.C. were uh, Sikawakamako, the Piscataway capital of, of Moyone, and the Nakachtank, or also known as Anacostia. Uh, and the Patuxent were the uh, Aquintanaxic, Patuxent, and Mattapanai, or Mattapanai. Uh, Smith described friendly encounters, but noted that the Patawomek were enemies of the people of Moyone and Anacostia at that time. Uh, Iroquoian groups were also present in what is now Maryland, which included the Susquehannock at the head of the bay and the Massawomack northwest, northwest of D.C. The Massawomack were said to frequently raid other towns, and Smith was told that, that they had recently killed 100 Piscataway uh, in a raid. Uh, prior to the arrival of uh, the Maryland English in 1634, there were already two notable traders operating here. Henry Fleet and William Claiborne. Uh, in 1623, Fleet, a fur trader, while at the Patawomac village, was taken into captivity at Anacostia, where he was held until 1627. Uh, he later resumed his trade in 1634 or 1632, and finding few furs at that time to trade with at uh, Patawomac and Moyone, Fleet went upriver to the Anacostia town. Uh, there he found there was a split between them and the Piscataway leadership, and this was due to disagreement over who would serve as middlemen in trading with the Massawomek, with the Nakotchtank or Anacostia wanting to go their own way. Uh, Fleet was told that the Massawomek had killed approximately 1,000 Piscataway as part of these disputes. Fleet desired to trade with the Massawomek directly in his journals recount that the Nakotchtank or Anacostia and Piscataway leadership desired to maintain control of the trade while Fleet was maneuvering to upset that network to maximize his own profits. Uh, Fleet's experience led him to be an interpreter for the Maryland colonists. Um, unlike the earlier Virginia colony uh, and colonists who had limited knowledge about the political landscape, the Maryland English uh, had decades of presence of the Virginians to the south and the trading relationships of fleet that gave them valuable intelligence. Uh, trade with the Massawomics was initially viewed as a revenue source for the early colony. However, the last known document relating to them came from a 1634 letter where Leonard Calvert wrote that they arrived at the first part of the trading season and that most furs had already been traded to fleet and Claiborne. 
Uh, William Claiborne had established a trading venture on Kent Island prior to the arrival of the Maryland colonists, and he primarily traded with the Susquehannock. Uh, Claiborne and Fleet themselves shared numerous business ties with London merchants, but maintained different trade areas. Uh, Claiborne would come into conflict with the Maryland government, and the elimination of his enterprise by that government would have later ramifications with uh, relations with the Susquehannock. Uh, Fleet and Claiborne's operations uh, caused a number of issues for, for Native people. The introduction of European goods and the cutting out of trade at Piscataway towns uh, disrupted established networks. The Susquehannock and the Massawomack may have gotten better deals trading directly with the English and could effectively cut the Piscataway off. The Susquehannock in particular were seeing their influence in the region rise and they were recorded throughout the early part of the century as um, raiding Piscataway villages. And so the Piscataway then found themselves surrounded by threats from multiple sides. Uh, to the southwest were the rival Patawomek, uh, who were allied with the Virginia English. To the northwest were the Massawomek, and to the northeast the Susquehannock. And now uh, the Marylanders have come onto the scene. Uh, when Fleet took the Maryland colonists to the Piscataway capital of Moyone, the Tyak Wanis uh, told them that he bid them not to stay or go, uh, as Kyle had already mentioned. And Wanis's language was carefully measured. Uh, he was intentionally vague, and the English interpreted it as that they would not be stopped uh, where they would choose to settle. Um, unofficially, he allowed the colonists to stay, and ultimately that led to the establishment of St. Mary City at a location negotiated locally with the Yakamako, uh, a constituent Piscataway group. So essentially, Marylanders were allowed, but at a distance. Um, and the location put Piscataway settlements between the English and the Massawomack and Susquehannock. Uh, the Piscataway potentially saw the colonists as just one of several threats, but they could also be allies in their ongoing conflicts and could also result in a better trade relationship. And this may be part of the reason why uh, Jesuit missionaries were also granted access to towns. Uh, the Calverts saw that uncontrolled trade could have unforeseen consequences. Um, beginning in 1638, trade licenses were granted through the Calvert government. Uh, which would also receive revenue from the issuance of those licenses. A letter written by a Jesuit in the colony at the time wrote that the rulers of this colony have not yet allowed us to dwell among the natives. They have having slain a man from this colony who is uh, staying among them for the sake of trading. Uh, a year later, another Jesuit uh, letter stated that by that time, Father Andrew White, the head Jesuit in the colony, was described as living with the Piscataway Tayac. Uh, the letter, letter further stated that the leader of the town of the Patuxent, quote unquote, gifted land to them at Mattapanai. Uh, by the time Father Andrew Wright, White was residing with the Piscataway, there had recently been a coup among Piscataway leadership. Uh, the Tayak Wanis was murdered by his brother Kitamakun, who took over as Tayak in 1636. Um, the reasons for this are unknown, but the consequences are, are somewhat more clear. Uh, following the coup, Kitamakun was viewed as an illegitimate ruler by many, um, and as a result, he sought closer ties to the English to protect his power. Uh, ties so close that Leonard Calvert referred to him as my brother. Um, Kitamakun struck up friendly uh, relations with Father Andrew White and was famously baptized by him in 1640. Uh, Kitamakun's daughter, who was referred to as Mary, was sent to live in St. Mary's with Margaret Brent and would later marry her brother Giles Brent. Uh, Kitamakun died in 1644, but before his death, he had conferred power to select a new Tayak to the English, which Later on, uh, this was exercised as the English approval of successors rather than the English making an active selection. Uh, immediately after Kinnamakun's death, the English did name a successor that the Piscataway rejected and uh, appointed Wayakaso as their leader, which the uh, English recognized in 1644. So with the Piscataway forging a convenient relationship with the English, the Susquehannock uh, lost their trading status. 
Uh, the Susquehannocks, Wacomico, and Nanticoke were declared enemies of the colony in 1642 due to a murder at Kent Island and other raids. Uh, in 1644, the Maryland government received reports uh, from the Piscataway that the Susquehannock planned to come to Moyone, which the government feared would result then uh, in them joining forces against the English. Uh, in response, Henry Fleet and a militia were dispatched to Moyone to prevent this. Uh, during Ingalls' Rebellion uh, between 1644 and 1647, uh, William Claiborne conspired with Richard Ingle, who led a Protestant uprising that retook control at Kent Island and commandeered the colonial government. Uh, and as soon as Leonard Calvert regained control of the colony, two laws were passed. Uh, an act touching pagans is what one was called, which created rules governing relations, and another called uh, Act concerning purchasing land from Indians, which essentially annulled any individual land purchases directly between uh, English colonists and uh, Indians uh, individually. Uh, the 1650 saw several attempts to broker peace and assert control. Uh, in 1651, a reservation was established at Choptico in St. Mary's County for the uh, Mattapanian or Mattapanai Yakamako. Tuxen, Lama, Sconson, Kaya, Nixon, and Choptico people, um, part of the Piscataway umbrella. While some of these groups were known to have been under that Piscataway umbrella, it may also represent a willingness among some of them to break away. Um, this may be a result of some of those schisms related to the assassination of Juanus. Uh, Choptico Manor was served served as that uh, reservation located in an area of increased English encroachment. Uh, the people living there were in more contact with English colonists than, than some of the other towns. Um, archaeologically, um, this is manifested in the wealth of trade goods at the Choptico Indian Town and a nearby trading site at St. Clement's Manor. Uh, in 1652, a peace treaty was secured with the Susquehannock, which laid out areas off limits to the English, which encompassed land from the head of the Patuxent River up to the Susquehanna River and across to the eastern shore. Uh, land concessions to the Piscataway were far less generous, um, perhaps due to an outsized desire by the colonial government to secure a peace with the Susquehannock. An alliance with the English led to war between the Susquehannock and the Five Nations Iroquois further north in, in Pennsylvania and in New York. Uh, the Five Nations also targeted the Piscataway in the English frontier settlements because of these shared alliances. Uh, in 1661, the Susquehanna, Susquehannock strengthened their alliance with Maryland, which led to a pledge of military support, and war was declared by the English against the Five Nations in 1664. Uh, alliances among the Susquehannock and Piscataway with the English were strengthened in two separate treaties in 1666. The treaties with the Susquehannock described conflicts with the Five Nations. Uh, the fear of major reprisals led the Susquehannock to convey that the Five Nations planned to storm the Susquehannock fort and attack the English. Um, in negotiating a new peace, uh, the Piscataway and others also raised the issue of English encroachment, illustrating that they were concerned about colonial expansion. Uh, signers of this treaty included uh, the Nakotch Tank, uh, Dog, Makika Woman, Masquistan, uh, Matawoman, Chincoteague, Nanjimoy, Potabaco, Sakayo, Pangayo, and Choptico. Uh, the treaty stipulated that the colonists were to follow or what rules they had to follow to avoid confrontation, but also carved out provisions for English military assistance in the establishment of other reservations such as Piscataway Manor. Uh, treaties were not signed enthusiastically. Uh, in some cases, the treaty required uh, people to agree to the terms or be declared enemies, and their outside relations were to be made with the consent of the English. Uh, this may have instigated a flight of some native people from Maryland to the Rappahannock River in Virginia. Uh, the Potabaco moved near the existing town of Nanzatico, east of Port Royal, and the Dogue settled a few miles upriver from there. Uh, the Rappahannock was less settled by colonists who hadn't arrived in that river valley until the 1650s and later. 
Um, by 1670, the Piscataway sought to revive uh, treaties again, describing themselves as, quote, now reduced to a small number, perhaps as a result of this diaspora. Notably absent from the 1666 treaty are the people of the Patuxent River, such as the Patuxent and Mattapanai. Uh, both were listed among the tribes to resettle at the Choptica Reservation over a decade before, and the last uh, reference to a native town on the Patuxent was in 1658 in southern uh, PG County, where records indicate that they uh, would later continue living on English plantations in the area, and in the 1670s, some are said to be residing on land patent to an Englishman named John Billingsley. Uh, as the English population expanded, land was uh, patented quickly. Between 1650 and 1660, the English population doubled, and the dispossession of native land became an unofficial policy of the government. Um, one such example is the dispossession of the Mattapanai and Patuxent lands by people tied to the Calverts directly. Uh, a 1663 law did state that no European could settle within three miles of an Indian town, but eliminating those towns would open up vast lands that they could then sell to, to colonists. Uh, Augustine Herman's 1670 map of Maryland illustrates an area of the Patuxent devoid of English presence in the vicinity of the Mattapanai Fort uh, with English settlements to the north and south. The first patents issued following the town's abandonment were all to friends and family of the Calverts. Uh, the pressure campaign on the uh, Mattapanai Patuxent began with the establishment of Mount Calvert way up the river in 1658. At some point in the early 1670s, the Susquehannock had re relocated to a fort near the Piscataway capital of Moyone. Um, the Calverts wished to relocate them as a gesture to negotiate peace with the Five Nations, and Susquehannock relations took a dramatic turn very shortly thereafter. Um, in the summer of 1675, a party of uh, Dogue stole some hogs from a Virginia plantation, which spiraled into retaliatory violence. Um, a pursuit of those offending Dogue led a Virginia militia to the Susquehannock Fort, which is now at Piscataway Park uh, on Piscataway Creek. A conflict erupted involving militia from Maryland and Virginia, with aided by the Piscataway and Mattawoman, who laid a prolonged siege. Uh, the Susquehannock, who survived, uh, and escape then proceeded to retaliate against English plantations in parts of Virginia, which uh, snowballed into the Virginia genocide known as Bacon's Rebellion. Uh, the Piscataway broke ties with the Susquehannock as part of this, expecting colonists to have their back. Uh, many of the Susquehannock uh, who survived would later be absorbed by the Five Nations Iroquois, and by 1677, the Maryland government sought a treaty with the Five Nations, Susquehannock, and Piscataway as an overarching treaty, but those negotiations ultimately failed. Uh, other colonists did not think the Calverts were acting swift enough against uh, Native people who they viewed as all suspicious, and they used religion um, with some colonists making claims as early as 1678 that the Catholic uh, Calvert government and the Indians were in league to kill all the Protestants. Uh, by 1680, it was reported that the Susquehannock constructed another fort next to the Piscataway. This time being enemies, the Piscataway requested English assistance. Uh, the Susquehannock demanded revenge for the earlier siege, while the Piscataway re uh, requested firearms, gunpowder, and shot. Uh, the Susquehannock retaliated against the Mattawoman as a result, killing many. Um, as a result, the government sought to remove the Piscataway, quote unquote, for their protection. Um, concerns were raised that the Susquehannock violence in Virginia could also be blamed on the Piscataway. Uh, so in 1680, as a way to circumvent this, the Piscataway were added to the famous Virginia Treaty of Middle Plantation. Uh, the Maryland government decided to relocate the Piscataway to Zakiah Swamp, maintaining a buffer of protection for the English, all of this under the guise of being for the Piscataway's protection. Uh, the Piscataway constructed a fort just south of Waldorf known as Zakiah Fort. Um, despite the move, the Piscataway were not immune to continued attacks by the Susquehannock and Five Nations. 
uh, the Piscataway blamed their alliance with the English for these attacks and would use that as leverage in requesting firearms. Um, the Piscataway would state in their request that they required guns because they had forgotten how to produce bows and arrows. Uh, archaeological evidence from the Zakaya Fort site included firearms, um, but it also included projectile points, indicating that uh, the Piscataway were being clever and playing the English to get what uh, get access to firearms. Uh, growing uneasiness about their English alliance, the Piscataway tried to raise support for an armed uprising. Uh, in 1681, a uh, Mata woman chief had relayed that the Piscataway sent a present of shell beads and an axe to the Nanticoke as a call to war against the English. Uh, the Nanticoke rejected this call, but it was passed along all the way uh, to upstate New York to the Iroquois. Uh, finding little support, the Piscataway continued to occupy Zakaya Fort into the early 1690s. When the Calvert government was overthrown in the Protestant Revolution in 1689, uh, Native people were skeptical of whether peace treaties would be honored. The Native allies of the prior government were perceived by the Protestants as a threat, and as a result, some Piscataway began to slowly trickle and move out of Zakaya Fort, relocating to English plantations. Um, Zakaya Fort would be completely abandoned by 1692, and by 1697, much of uh, what the Maryland government considered the then Piscataway leadership removed themselves to Virginia. Uh, the Choptico remained at their town and reservation into the early 18th century, despite the change in government. Uh, their final appearance in colonial records came from a grave robbing incident at the tomb of the Choptico Queen's daughter in 1707. Uh, restitution was paid to them in 1712 after a long battle. Um, after that point, there is what Gabrielle Tayak describes as a eerie historic silence in terms of the documentary record. But despite a silence in, in those written records, uh, Choptico people remained in the landscape. Uh, oral histories pointed to descendants of that town living on tracks nearby. Uh, the location of the town is also mentioned in land records uh, much later as shown here. Um, anthropologists in the 19th century would note the presence of surviving communities throughout the region. Um, some had retained knowledge even of the location of Zakaya Fort hundreds of years after the fact. Uh, shown on the right here is a sketch made by Smithsonian anthropologist William Gilbert, who uh, was just sketching uh, places within Southern Maryland with significant Piscataway populations. And that letter was written in 1945. So despite a silence in like official state records, native people still endured uh, living in close knit communities. And I do realize that uh, it's getting pretty late. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. So thank you for having me again. Yeah, thank you so much. That was really interesting. Thank you for sharing. Um, really appreciate your presence with us as well tonight, Scott, thank you. Um, next, I think let's move into a quick Q&A. I wanna respect that we're, we're far over time here, but um, it's, I think, been a fruitful and important conversation, and I'm glad that we had the opportunity to hear um, from Kyle and Scott tonight. Um, and that being said, I also do kind of wanna um, move out of, um, colonial mode a little bit out of the colonial history um, emphasis. I think that's important, but I also kind of want to bring us back into that contemporary moment of where we are now. Um, what what can we do was I think one question I saw from the chat that I would like to invite us all to discuss before we close out tonight. I know there have been some suggestions mentioned in the chat, but for people who are not in the chat, I would love to hear um, if anyone has any suggestions, you know, I, I, and I echo this, you know, as a white person, what can I do to support tribal people um, and to support Native American groups in my local area? Yeah, great question. I think, um, you know, in the chat, it was perfectly answered for the Piscataway. It's direct support to tribal communities and the nonprofits that they have set up. Um, you know, in the tribal chat, 
you saw that the URL got posted up. Um, you know, Chris, you had it up on the screen also. That um, that right there, that nonprofit, the Rupus Got Away Eyes, that was founded by Chief Swan. There's a lot of work that's being done. And, you know, the most important that I would like to draw attention to, um, just in overall, is land. Um, the Rupus Got Away Eyes has set up a land trust for the tribal community. And that is the first time that the Piscataway has owned land in over 400 years. And with the donations that we see re receive monetarily, that goes towards the construction of things like our cultural museum, tribal office, um, cultural archives, and so forth. But, you know, we also, we take on additional parts of land and we leave that open for people to donate um, if they're willing to, because at the end of the day, repatriation to tribal communities is the utmost important. And, you know, that is individual to each person in their role of life. Wonderful, great. Um, and I've included that, that, I'm just screen sharing that um, slide again for anyone um, interested in donating to the scholarship fund. Um, next, I'm just going to, to add um, a survey form. Um, this is the self-serving part of the evening where I'm asking you to just provide some feedback on how the night went, um, anything you learned, any main takeaways, things you wish you were able to get more of. Um, really looking forward to just hearing your feedback. Also, if it was a good event, that helps me know the kinds of events we'll continue to do. Um, so um, it's just a helpful insight for me to better understand what to continue offering in the future for us. Um, so with that, I just want to respect everyone's time. Um, you know, here on the screen, I've got this donation form in the chat. I put the um, survey that you could please follow up with. Um, we'll also include that in our follow-up correspondences. So if anyone has any resources that they would like to share, please do email me. Um, you can email me at programs at peacethroughaction.org um, or really any of our Peace Through Action uh, multiple contact lists, which I'm not going to go, I'm not gonna show you our contact form because I wanna keep the donations page up. Um, but yeah, please, please do share and I'll make sure to distribute that and share that with the group more broadly. Um, so yeah, also any local participants in the Calvert County, Maryland area, we invite you to attend our peace and justice table to discuss local strategies for peace building and nonviolent approaches. Um, we would like to thank our guest speakers so very much for your attendance with us tonight. Thank you both so very much. Um, and thank you. Thank you. It sounds, seems like we have some of the Swan family here too. So thanks for, um, all the, all your, for all of you coming um, to support that. Um, and yeah, both both Kyle and Scott, thank you for sharing um, about everything you shared with us tonight. Um, so thank you for taking your time, energy, and effort to help promote social cohesion and increase social understanding. We're grateful for your contributions and helping us to honor and value Native American peoples. We also would like to thank Kyle and the Pis Piscataway Kanoi tribe for their willingness to speak with us this evening. I'm very grateful for your presence with us. To our participants, thank you for attending our event this evening. Thank you for all of you for sticking it out and um, hanging in there with us. And we look forward to seeing you throughout our robust schedule of events, activities, and programs throughout the coming year. Thank you very much and have a wonderful evening. Again, I'll share as much resources as I can with you. And um, we look forward to connecting with everyone again soon and in the future. So I'm gonna stop sharing here and um, close out our evening. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. I got your message. Thank you. Appreciate your presence here with us. Thank you.
All righty. So I'm going to close us out here. Thanks again and have a wonderful evening.